Welcome everyone to the Canadian Diabetes Association's 2016 webinar series. My name is Farah Ismail and I will be your host for today. We are delighted that you're able to join us today for the webinar on Stress Less with Diabetes. Now to start off, I would like to draw your attention to our survey. It's located at the top right hand section of your screen. So in order for us to better serve your needs, we kindly ask that you provide us with your input by completing the short survey towards the end of the presentation. And we thank you in advance for your input. Throughout our presentation this evening, you'll have the opportunity to type in the question and answer box, and it's located at the bottom right-hand section of your screen. And we ask that you use this for any questions you have along the way, and our presenter will be happy to respond to it at the end of the presentation. As well, we will be displaying a few polling questions throughout the presentation and would love for your participation. Please note that your answers will remain completely anonymous. Also note that you're able to customize your screens. You can expand or collapse them as you see fit, so feel free to do so by adjusting the bottom right-hand corner of each of our webinar pods. Our presentation today will last about 45 minutes in length and we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. I do want to let everyone know that it is recorded and it will be posted on our Canadian Diabetes Association's website at a later date. Now before I introduce our speaker for today, I would like to thank our supporter, Canola Eatwell, for being part of our webinar program. And now I'd like to welcome Gwen Morgan and thank her for joining us today. But before turning it over to Gwen, I'd like to give you a brief introduction. Gwen Morgan is a registered social worker with more than 28 years experience working in healthcare settings with a specialization in chronic illness. She worked for several years at TRIDEC, the Diabetes Education Centre at Women's College Hospital Toronto, where she ran workshops on coping with diabetes and reducing diabetes-related stress. Gwen has been facilitating mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and mindful eating programs. Currently, she is working with the Centre for Mindfulness Studies in Toronto. So, for more information on Gwen, please read the speaker bio section, which is located to the left of your screen. So without further ado, I present to you Gwen Morgan. So hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about stress less with diabetes, which I've written this way on purpose uh, rather than as one word, stressless diabetes, which would be a misnomer because there is stress in living with diabetes. And today we're going to look closely at what diabetes distress is and ways to manage it. And before we do that, we're going to go through a few poll questions here. So how are you affected by diabetes? You could just tick off the information. Ah, so the majority here have uh, type 2 diabetes. That is the focus of um, this talk on diabetes distress, although there will be information that's applicable to everyone, those living with type 1, and uh, their supporters and also healthcare professionals. So how are you participating today as an individual, a group, and our group six or more? Most as an individual. All right, I guess that was the, the two questions. So beginning, so today, of course, we're exploring diabetes distress. Um, in order to gain a better understanding of it and how it is different from other related conditions like depression and anxiety and burnout, and we will identify also the triggers to diabetes distress and ways to cope, uh, with a particular emphasis on mindfulness, which is just one area that may be helpful, but also offering some other techniques, advice, and resources. So let's begin with the definition of diabetes distress used by the CDA. And instantly, just, uh, just to mention, the CDA has an excellent guideline for professionals on assessing diabetes distress, and it's in the resources um, uh, on the website here. So diabetes distress 
It refers to the unique and often hidden emotional burdens and worry that are part of the patient's experience when managing a demanding chronic condition like diabetes. And in thinking of burdens and worries and demands, um, it might be helpful to recall Hans Seeley's formal definition of stress, which is a generalized total body-mind response to any demand from the environment, good or bad. The body-mind reacts in the same way. So stress is not the cause, but it is the effect of demands made on us, on our body and mind. So expanding on this uh, understanding of stress, this was some years ago, but I thought it'd be useful to look at the human function curve that was created by Dr. Peter Nixon. Uh, he was a cardiologist in the UK. And he was um, noticing in his practice how exhausted many of his cardiac patients were. And he wanted to map out the relationship between stress and performance. So specifically, he identified a comfort zone, which you can see here, of optimal performance, beyond which good stress, he labeled, the normal demands and challenges of everyday life, begin to become distress when the demands on the human system are depleting too much energy and then leading to fatigue and exhaustion and ill health and breakdown. So thinking in terms of demands on your energy, stress is a normal part of life, but there is a point when there are just too many demands and then we are in the downward curve of distress. So this is where people who are experiencing diabetes distress may be placed. So Lawrence Fisher and William Polanski are two psychologists um, from UC San, uh, San Francisco and UC San Diego, and they've done a lot of research and writing on diabetes stress and distress over the years. They're sort of key in this whole area. And I have some quotes taken here to illustrate some of the nuances of diabetes distress that they highlight in their research. First, that the emotional reactions are tied to behavioral challenges of the daily diabetes management. And both the emotion and the behavioral taken together are integral to the burden, particularly the emotional burden of diabetes. And secondly, you know, and I think this is important, that the struggle that people experience is around making changes, setting goals, and then trying to meet these goals, and all of these contribute to diabetes distress. So in the research uh, done, and this, this is actually a comment from several years ago, but there's research recently, it's the same. People describe their experience of living with diabetes like a battle. Um, and you can see here the person saying, if I don't control it, it's going to control you. It's like a continuous challenge, day in, day out. There's not one day you get a break, not a day. And if you don't keep fighting, I'm just paraphrasing here now, but you can read it. It's going to defeat you. It's as simple as that. Or this other phrase, diabetes is the enemy. It can't become a friend ever. It's warfare. But you're at war with yourself. A lot of insight and a lot of uh, depth of feeling being expressed by people living with diabetes distress. So we just have a poll question here for those of you living with diabetes. Feeling overwhelmed by the minds of diabetes, is this not a problem, moderate, or a serious problem? This is one of the two questions in a diabetes distress scale developed by Polanski. Yeah, so 35% into the above moderate and 22% serious. So this is really interesting. The research, um, particularly by Lawrence Fisher, he describes an article in Diabetes Care place the prevalence of diabetes distress at 18 to 35 percent, but when he measured over an 18-month period, 38 to 48 percent, so almost 50 percent. So we've got something very similar here. 
And this is the second question in the diabetes distress scale, feeling that I'm often failing at my diabetes regimen. Yeah, so moderate and uh, and just above. And three on the diabetes distress scale is the cutoff for moving into the area where one really has to start to look at diabetes distress and how it's affecting your life and, and finding ways to cope with it more effectively. So why a new designation? You know, we already have psychologists writing on diabetes stress, and Polanski wrote a book on diabetes burnout, and we've had research on other mental health issues, including depression, and its effect on diabetes as a comorbidity. And depression, we just uh, want to emphasize here, is a really serious uh, comorbidity with diabetes. 22% of people with diabetes may experience depression. This is compared to the general population average of 7%. Um, And then Patrick Lessman uh, from the University of Washington, this is a while ago in a landmark study at the time, demonstrating the importance of diagnosing and treating depression. So his research showed that people with diabetes who receive diabetes education and treatment for depression, and he did two different studies. So whether it was by medication, antidepressants, or with CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. Both these groups did better than a control group, which received diabetes education alone. So, and as a result of his studies and others, screening for depression had, has become part of good diabetes care, and it still is. His research also established the importance of the psychological um, in medical treatment and diabetes care. But something didn't add up. Fisher and Polanski and others began to look more closely at the clinical data on diabetes and depression. And Fisher found in a study of 506 patients that 70% of the people with diabetes who scored above the cutoff point for depressive affect on a CSD depression screen were actually not clinically depressed when a fuller assessment was done. So another pivotal study was done by Van Bastelaar and his colleagues in the Netherlands who looked at the medical records from 627 people with both type 1 and type 2 diabetes who completed measures for depression and, uh, and for stress. And his study showed that depressed people who were not distressed on the uh, um, Polanski scale for uh, problems in diabetes care did not show an increased risk for poor uh, for poor di- glycemic control. However, when patients were both depressed and had diabetes distress, there were poor glycemic outcomes. And when they were not depressed but had diabetes di- distress, there was also Um, poor outcomes. So from their research, they concluded that diabetes distress, unlike depression, was directly linked to poor glycemic control and problematic self-care behaviors. And Fisher's uh, research um, reached the same conclusion. And Fisher was saying that diabetes distress is more strongly and independently related to the behavioral and clinical measures of glycemic outcome. So diabetes distress was a missing link, explaining the presence of both the depressive symptoms and the poorer self-care. So why is this important? Well, if you only treat depression, you may be, figuratively speaking, barking up the wrong tree. Because research is showing that it's important to address diabetes distress even when there is depression present in order for there to be improvement in glycemic outcomes. And if the real issue is diabetes distress, this higher end of the curve, this human function curve where energy is depleted with the emotional struggle with diabetes at its root, then we can help patients better if we treat the real source of the problem. 
and Fisher also did research on interventions with people with type 2 who had both depression and high scores of diabetes distress on this new scale uh, Polanski developed. And again, in three different types of program that he tested in all cases, there was significantly reduced depressive symptoms as well as reduced distress. Just through effective diabetes education that addressed some of the triggers and factors that were contributing to uh, distress. So another point in all of this is um, that I think is really important that uh, Fisher makes is that diabetes distress is normal. So if we're really talking about diabetes distress is the key, many patients may be misdiagnosed with clinical uh, depression, and they may be um, labeled with a level of uh, pathology, which is really not there and perhaps unnecessary. So we want to emphasize the normality of diabetes distress. And okay, this might actually sound a little depressing, but there's a kernel of hope here because you may not have another medical condition, but it is tough. Um, but more importantly, you are not alone. Right, There's a lot of people, and you can see from our poll here, who are suffering with diabetes distress. And then from a mindfulness perspective, uh, where we're looking at acceptance, uh, the fact that there are negative feelings associated with living with diabetes is important because we don't have to get rid of them to manage diabetes effectively. In fact, we really can't get rid of them. They come along with the whole package of diabetes. But we can find ways to manage them more effectively. So just to sum up uh, this part, sort of you know, defining uh, what diabetes distress is or, and what it isn't, in summary, so it's more than worry because it's really on the high spectrum of this stress function curve. It's in the distress zone. Um, it's not regular stress, quote unquote, really, because um, you get to deal with that too, work, family, finances, but this is diabetes specific. It's not clinical anxiety. We haven't really talked about that here, but um, general anxiety disorder, DSM-3, um, because this is really specific to diabetes. It may actually involve burnout, um, which is at the very end of the downward sl curving slope. And burnout is more commonly experienced with people um, with type 1 diabetes who are experiencing diabetes distress. And then what the research is showing is it may not be clinical depression or diabetes distress is not clinical depression, but it does include depressive symptoms. Um, so it really uh, behooves um, um, healthcare professionals to try and sort this out. Um, Dr. Fisher says it's messy, it's hard to define, it's hard to distinguish from other states. But this is why a better tool for assessing diabetes distress was being developed by Polanski and by Fisher. So this is the website, the Behavioral Diabetes website, and the assessment tool developed by Polanski is on this website, um, along with the other ones, because he's developed, just released one that's specifically for people living with type 2. The diabetes distress scale that we're going to be looking at is for people with type 2. I think I said type, he's just released a new one for type 1 is what I meant there. The type 2 one scale that's been up there for a while and being used for research has 17 questions uh, that people can self-assess on a scale of 1 to 6. And the overall score of greater than 3 is considered high distress, but even if you have a score greater than 2, that can show up in terms of challenges and difficulties around uh, behavioral management, and it can show up in, um, in glycemic um, outcomes. And there's four subcategories. Each of these subcategories has a score on its own. And uh, emotional burden, 
physician-related distress and regiment distress and interpersonal distress. And we're going to look at each of these here uh, today and then some of the ways that maybe we could cope with them more effectively. So just to say that, uh, just to highlight that each of these er four areas details the triggers to diabetes distress in type 2. So the triggers to diabetes distress are really embedded in the daily management, like we said. And this makes it very challenging and easy to be caught in vicious cycles of feeling bad, doing less, feeling worse, round and round. So now we'll just take a poll again here. What are the difficult emotions you feel around diabetes? And you can select all that apply. Okay, so here we have, and these, of course, a lot of negative emotions, feeling feeling feel, fearful, angry, overwhelmed, sad, shamed, right? So like I said previously, uh, previously, difficult emotions are part, they're a normal part of living with diabetes. And there can be this range of emotions felt at different times or sometimes you can cycle through emotions like this is sort of grieving process, feeling sad, then angry, then guilty, then overwhelmed and hopeless, and maybe all of this in one day. And with diabetes distress and feeling so strongly all these emotions, it can be very threatening to stop and attend to the emotions, to really feel them. And you may have the underlying thought, if I do this, these emotions will just overwhelm me. However, in the process of coping with emotions, it is important first to acknowledge them. So acknowledging the feelings will provide clues to self-care. If it's guilt, there's maybe one strategy and anger, there's another. And also emotions are moving through the body and affecting the body. And we're often out of touch with our bodies, especially if we feel betrayed by the body when we have diabetes. But stopping to acknowledge emotions also allows us to notice how emotions are showing up in thoughts. And sometimes we hear people say things like, oh, I can feel when I'm high or low, I don't have to check. Or why bother? It's just going to get me in the end anyway. So I want to say a little bit about denial as a coping mechanism. So when we move into denial, it's it actually is a way that we're trying to cope with these feelings, um, especially the, when we start to feel overwhelmed. And if you have diabetes distress, you undoubtedly experience a lot of negative feelings and thoughts. And this avoidance is one way to try and get rid of them. And denial is like super avoidance. And in the short term, this may not, this may be okay. So Polanski in his book on diabetes burnout points out the positive side of denial as a coping mechanism. It's a way to compartmentalize distress. Uh, also, he says sometimes you just need a vacation from your diabetes. And all the feelings and frustrations are put on ice, and this just allows you to cruise through your day. So while working, quote-unquote, in the short run, avoidance and denial do not work in the long run, because the body is still experiencing all this distress. It's still going through the activation, through the stress hormones, the stress reactivity, the fight, flight, and freeze, causing this cascade, cascade of hormonal effects and body tension, fatigue, and mental agitation, and perhaps even affecting blood glucose directly, causing highs, sometimes type 1 causing lows, and also affecting blood glucose, especially when denial takes you into ignoring diabetes self-care. So how is this emotion tied to behavior? So imagine this. Imagine what happens if when you're reaching for your glucose meter, and what comes with this, unbidden, is 
all those distressful memories, thoughts, and emotions. You might just avoid the meter, and then you don't have to feel all that emotional turmoil, and it works in the short term, except in the long term, not monitoring has other negative effects. It's sort of like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So another way that we often try to get rid of negative feelings and thoughts associated with them is through trying to control them. So I've got a picture here. Imagine the effort it takes to hold the beach ball under the water. It can be done. It's not right or wrong. We're not talking about right or wrong here. But what happens when your hands slip? What happens to the ball? So there are two types of coping strategies involved in control. There's the passive control, which involves avoiding or withdrawing from potentially distressful experiences, like the example I just gave you the meter. And then there's active control, which involves attempting to suppress distressing feelings and thoughts and sensations from your awareness. For example, try not to think about the effect of ignoring your monitoring or forgetting to take your medication and what that might mean for your health or trying to ignore the feelings of fatigue or dizziness or whatever is showing up. And again, it's not the actual control strategies that are the problem because, again, sometimes they work. But when you have really high, high emotions and high diabetes distress, they don't work so well. It's like having an itch, like just a normal itch, and you scratch and get relief. But if you have a skin condition, like eczema, you scratch, you do get relief. But then the eczema flares up, and then there's more itchiness, and you scratch more, and there's more flare-up. So the solution to scratch is not working, and emotions can be like this. And also, paradoxically, research has shown that this type of control actually produces an upsurge in the very experience you're trying to suppress. So instead of getting fewer painful thoughts and feelings, you get more. Because when you try to repress something, there's a little light bulb that goes on your mind that's monitoring, you know, whether you're successful at this or not. And when I'm speaking in my classes to illustrate this, I often say to people, don't think of the pink elephant. Don't think about pink elephants. So now you're thinking about pink elephants. You weren't thinking about it before. So in order not to think about it, you're thinking about it. So the problem is, and I love this quote, it's from Stephen Hayes, the mind is not logical. It is psychological. So what to do? Unpleasant feelings just don't go away when ignored. And so we have to allow time to feel them and to examine them, to notice how they're showing up in terms of feelings, thoughts, and body sensations. So I'm going to share with you, though, right, um, two uh, different uh, ways to deal with... Um, being with unpleasant feelings. But this is a technique. This is a cognitive behavioral technique. It's from Dr. David Burns, who's a CBT psychologist. And there's references in the back. So you, you go through, if you're looking at the slides again, you'll see um, some footnotes where I've given references in the back. And what he is suggesting is that you schedule at least two periods a day where you're allowing yourself to fully feel your diabetes distress so that where people put their fear, people put their anger, that general feeling of being overwhelmed. So you plan ahead, you put it down in your day, and you do this for 5 to 10 or 10 to 15 minutes. And it's helpful to be alone when you're doing this. This is what research has found. Sometimes sympathy from another person just backfires. And you allow yourself to be flooded with these painful thoughts. And think all the sad, the angry, the despairing thoughts you want. If you feel sad, cry. If you feel mad, pound a pillow. And you flood yourself with the painful memories and thoughts. For this full period, you've set aside 
Right? You moan, you groan, you complain nonstop. But when the period is over, that 15 minutes is over, you stop it and you carry on with your day until the next scheduled period. And it may be helpful to take some really deep abdominal breaths at the end of this period, slowly elongating the out-breath, which activates the parasympathetic nervous system. And if the thoughts come up in between, you write them down and you hold them for the scheduled period. This is a CBT technique. You might want to try out and see how that works for you. So another way is to build your capacity to cope with difficult feelings um, is to is to practice uh, mindfulness. So mindfulness is the practice of being aware of what's happening right now. Mindful awareness is the opposite of avoidance and control. It's really an intentional decision to hold still in the face of distressing experiences and let them wash over you like waves. But mindfulness is an action. It's not a result. In mindfulness practice, we are building our capacity to give emotions and thoughts the space they need for us to feel them and to change how we relate to them. And in essence, let go of the battle with them. So we're going to do a little practice um, right now. Um, in mindfulness-based stress reduction, we begin learning mindfulness through practicing something we call the body scan. So we can do this sitting up also. So just shifting your body position so that your legs and your arms are unwound and your feet are flat on the floor. You can lean back in the chair, but with your body upright if you're sitting. And if you're looking to do this practice later um, or at another place online, it is usually done lying down so that the muscles can release into the floor or the mat. And then closing your eyes if you're comfortable or just letting your gaze fall in front of you. And bringing your attention to the sensations of the breath in the body. So breathing in and breathing out. You don't have to think about the breathing. It's just happening on its own. You don't have to manipulate it in any way. But you will notice thoughts coming and going, and that's okay. Just noting what they are is thinking or worrying, and then letting them be. And then when you're ready, moving your attention to the physical sensations around your head or scalp. If your eyes are closed, how do you know where your head is? I have a sense it's called interoception. So allowing yourself to become aware of any sensations or lack of sensations. Sensations of temperature, the air moving around the room, itchiness, internal sensations, whatever is present. Holding your awareness in the sensations, noticing them arise, persist, or change, and fade away. And now we're going, to go, we're going to scan through the body, and I will do this fairly quickly in the interest of our limited time we have here, but another time doing this, you can move more slowly. So from over the head, just moving your attention down the face, the forehead, the nose, the jawline, 
is a place that holds a lot of tension through the neck, the throat. Throat is often a place where emotion catches. The shoulders back and front. The chest. The stomach. The whole stomach and gut is a place where anxiety often rests in the body. And anxiety is often confused with feelings of hunger. And then around to the mid-back and then the lower back. And over the hips and pelvis. Feeling the weight against the chair. Down the legs to the feet. And feeling any sensations or lack of sensations. And noticing thoughts, letting them be, letting them float by, just as best you can. And now expanding the awareness to include the whole body and just noticing as you scan up and down the body where there's tension, noticing where there's ease. Just allowing your attention to move anywhere in the body and just noticing what is present as best you can. And now taking a deeper in-breath and on the out-breath releasing this practice. So when we do this practice in our class, we always ask people what they noticed at the end. So I'm just asking you here what you might have noticed. Yeah, so people noticed the tension in the body. They noticed sensation. And they noticed agitation and impatience and where it was showing up in the body and and lots of thinking. So our participants, they noticed sensation coming and going. They noticed lots of thinking. And they noticed how hard it is to stay present with the experience. Anyway, that's a little introduction to what is mindfulness practice. And we call it practice for a reason. This is we before we move on, I just want to reiterate again when diabetes distress is high, um, particularly around this emotional area, but in all areas, use your score on a the um scale to guide you in your choice to seek help and really do need if your score is three and over in particular to check in with your healthcare professional or your doctor so they can help you sort out the presence of uh depression. So what sort of thoughts sound familiar to you in relation to diabetes? Ah, okay. The thought I'm often failing with my diabetes regimen and that diabetes is taking too much of mental and physical energy and that it doesn't matter what I do. Yeah. Pretty tough thoughts to have and these are automatic thoughts that are really associated with the emotional distress. So we're just going to talk about uh, quickly a couple of ways that one could deal um, or one could learn to cope with um, the negative thoughts more effectively. And the first way people might be familiar um, with, and it's what we mentioned before, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so you can learn this on your own. There's websites um, that offer this um, online, particularly one called Mood Gym. And in, with uh, this way, we um, write down the thought that we have, and then we challenge it with evidence to the contrary. All right. 
And it has to be evidence because you have these thoughts and beliefs for a reason. They're actually protective and your mind will really hang on to them. So just giving a really quick example here, a fear, fear-based fear thought that I won't, I won't make healthy choices. I can't resist sweets. So you collect evidence. So one evidence before uh, pro or negative. Yes, that time I did eat half a dozen cookies, but I was really stressed. But there was that time over at Exodus when I chose not to have the dessert, and it was okay. Uh, Exodus didn't press me. I had fun. So this, you, with this evidence, you create a revised thought. So sometimes I can resist sweets, and sometimes I can't. So this is a skill that can be learned with practice and um, probably best learned with the help of a healthcare professional, but you can do this uh, on your own. And we can also bring mindfulness to thoughts. This is something that we learn towards the end of the groups that uh, we, um, you know, when we're teaching mindfulness. And we're learning this by playing close attention in a gentle and patient way to our thoughts, noticing how they come and go on their own, and we often use the analogy like clouds in the sky. And as we do this, we begin to appreciate that there's a difference between the thoughts and feelings and the person having the thoughts and feelings. As mindfulness skill, this takes time to develop, but there is a technique I just want to share with you quickly. Uh, It's called... um, it's a way to uh, develop the noticing self. And um, this is a technique that um, is talked about by uh, Greg and her colleagues who wrote the book, Diabetes Lifestyle Styles Skills. And um, so what you do with this is you, when the thoughts are turning around, you stop, you notice the thought, and then you add the phrase, I'm having the thought that in front of it. So, Noticing the difference of a thought that, oh, I'm going to lose my vision because my diabetes, just like my dad did. And then when you notice you're having that thought, you change it. and Just add this phrase, I'm having the thought that I'm going to lose my vision because of diabetes, just like my dad did. This is creating some emotional distance from the thought. So this is a technique that you could go ahead and start experimenting with. So what's your biggest frustration with diabetes? This is very similar to uh, to the other poll that we had, right? Regiment uh, distress which is actually this one, is uh, registering, is uh, one of the areas of diabetes distress that uh, people score the highest is. So here are some tips in terms of what to do around uh, your daily tasks and regimen. Um, So to cope more effectively here, it's important to focus your energy, to really choose one area to focus on. The mind in distress will want to do it all just to get it done and over with and perhaps be pushing you to take on too many tasks. But taking on too much and then inevitably not being able to accomplish it just leads to more distress. So to counter this, choosing one goal, making it small, and this builds evidence, thinking of that CBT thought challenge, builds evidence that you are managing. And we move forward from feelings of success and okayness, uh, mental whipping from ourselves or others. It's really not an effective long-term motivator. And it's also important to pace yourself. Start small, move slowly, as this increases the probability of being able to continue with your plan over time. And it also helps guard against those feelings of being overwhelmed. And this is a suggestion from uh, Lawrence Fisher, Um, and I think it's really important. He's sort of suggesting to focus on your immediate behavioral goals, not the long-term goals or outcomes. A person cannot directly control your weight, but you can control the number of calories that you're consuming today, right at this moment. 
So he's recommending you stay with what you can control, with what's happening right now. And then after a period of time, review this with your diabetes care team because there really are many factors that may be contributing to the long-term glycemic outcomes or other outcomes, a lot of which you can't control or manage on your own, including the need to adjust medications. Oh, oh I missed one slide in here, but let's just go to, to this one. <laughs> I put this in for lightness because I really, really uh, love this because we're talking about change and and uh, and um, y you know the effort required. But I just love this. It's uh, somebody I found uh, found on the internet today. I will live in the moment. We're talking about mindfulness. Unless this moment is unpleasant, in which case I'm going to eat a cookie. So okay, it happened. Let it go as best you can. Move on to the next moment and take care of yourself. Um, as you need to. So what interpersonal distress do you experience? Yeah, people don't appreciate how difficult living with diabetes can be. Well, that's like a really big one. So one way that a lack of understanding of how difficult diabetes care is that is expressed often is when families and friends offer unsolicited advice. And in diabetes education, we talk about the diabetes police. You might be familiar with this. It's a rather evocative way to capture a dynamic that sometimes arises in personal relationships with people who really mean well, but whose approach is really not that helpful. So in dealing with uh, diabetes police, um, it's really important to have a conversation and to set boundaries. Uh, maybe you would use Polanski's Diabetes Etiquette Chart as a guide, and you can find that on his website. And also remembering that mind reading is science fiction, so don't presume that your partner or friend should know what to do. And also, if you're a supporter, don't presume that you know. Ask and find a neutral time uh, to talk this out if you live together, booking a coffee date rather than having that discussion late at night just before you go to bed or over a noisy dinner with kids. Choose your time. And I want to share with you also here a technique. Again, this is also um, an adaptation from cognitive behavioral therapy, just something to try out, which might be fun. Uh, this is for the people you may have in your life for whom having an open dialogue is just not going to happen. And this um, this uh, technique is written by uh, Rosler and Polanski and Edelman in their book, The Secrets of Living and Loving with Diabetes. And they call it Beam Me Up, Scotty. So um, the effect is um, not to change the other person, but to mentally distance yourself from the sting of a thoughtless comment you know is probably coming. So step one, you anticipate the comment or the behavior, the comment on your behavior. And then step two, you keep score or you just enjoy the game. So, for example, um, so Andy J said to you when you arrived at the Christmas party, you know you can't have that. Um, but you had arrived and were reaching for you know, the cookie, the cake, or whatever, because you were stuck in traffic, you were really hungry, and you knew what you needed. So, ding, you keep a score. That's one. You keep this silently in your mind. And if someone else makes another comment, you keep score. Right. No comments, no score. So through this, which is sort of a fun way, you create some emotional distance from the sting of the comment. So you could try that out, and you can read about it in their book. So what about your healthcare professional that causes you distress? Okay, most people don't have distress with their healthcare professional. All right, or maybe it's not applicable. Um 
So one of the things that we, in terms of giving advice, is that what might help, though, because this is an area of distress for people uh, living with type 2 diabetes. It's one of the biggest, one not one of the biggest, but one of the triggers for diabetes distress. And here it's helpful for, for people to take charge of their health care goals. And the quote here, it's self-management. It can be overwhelming or it can be empowering when you really take charge. Either case, it's tough. So preparing ahead of time with questions and concerns, and there is a resource, and we've uh, uh, referenced it in the list of resources um, um, at the CDA. And then also being assertive and putting forward your own needs, and you need to plan ahead of time for this. Um, and the giving the crap sandwich is actually saying something positive, giving the punchline, and then saying something positive at the end. So, for example, one could say, oh, I appreciate that you had your secretary phone me with the results of my lab tests, and then the punch. But you know what? It's not helpful when you just focus on my highs and lows. Um, it just makes me feel stressed, but I need you to stop and listen to me while I problem solve through these test results. And then the positive, I appreciate your advice, and I want to make sure that we're on the same page. So you would rehearse this, think about it, but this idea of really being assertive. And the other thing is listen or being listened to. And research has shown um, that being listened to from a healthcare professional, even for three minutes, makes the biggest difference to uh, reducing diabetes distress. So I just want to say that mindfulness-based practices are best learned over this um, eight-week period that's been um, where the programs have been designed over um, because it's the capacity that we're building um, over time, right? Um, sort of like exercise. Um, and there are online programs, and this program is probably offered in your community. And the Center for Mindfulness Studies is offering a, here in Toronto, is offering a Mindfulness for Diabetes program. So one thing that is part of mindfulness, um, which can be helpful, um, and is brought to uh, situations where we're dealing with really, really high distress, really difficult situations, is this loving-kindness practice. And we can tell her this to diabetes distress. And so just for two minutes here, because I know we're pressed for time, let's just go through. Uh, I'll take you through what this would be like, and then um, there's be places where you can have reference or where you can find resources on this so again, you're sitting in the chair and you unravel yourself if you're uh, cross-laid in things. And you first bring your awareness to the breath. So it's a foundational practice. We're always coming to the breath because it's always here. And you can focus on it. All those times when the mind is agitated, you can drop into the breath. But in this practice, we're going to use three phrases, and I'm going to move through them very quickly here. If you're doing this on your own, you can take as long as you want with each phrase. In the first phrase, which we'll say on the out breath, may I be free from diabetes distress. Breathing in and then breathing out. May my body mind be free from diabetes distress. And if you're a visual person, you can imagine seeing yourself free from diabetes distress. And then repeating these phrases till you're ready to change. And when you're ready to change, saying, may I be at ease. May I be at ease. May my body be at ease. And then when you're ready to change to the next phrase, changing the phrase to, may I be happy and content. May I be happy and content. And again, if you'd like, imagine yourself as happy and content. So the three phrases are designed first to remove the negative, to become free of fear and distress, and then to establish a balanced state, and then to bring in a positive tone. May I be happy and content. 
and the most important time to do a loving kind of practice like this is when you are distressed and not feeling well. So in conclusion here, just to highlight some of our exploration into diabetes distress. So diabetes distress is the experience of distress, of being in a struggle, in a battle with your diabetes, in a struggle that you feel you're losing. It's not clinical depression or clinical anxiety, but it's important to sort this out with your doctor or diabetes healthcare team. And even if there is clinical depression, to feel better, diabetes distress has to be addressed independently. And so it's important to make the self-assessment yourself or healthcare professionals. You can use this tool to uh, identify diabetes distress, to identify what to target with diabetes distress, but to make the um, goals and change small and very specific towards increasing your internal resources. And most of all, to get support. People living with diabetes distress, you need support and to be kind to yourself. So thinking back to that human function visual, your energy and resources have been depleted and you're on that downward slope. And diabetes distress is then the roadblock to good self-care, which can be overcome when you skillfully move yourself back up that curve into the optimal zone. Not living without stress, but certainly living with less distress. This is a nice quote we often use. Um, you cannot stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. John Kabat-Zinn in um, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction uses this. And then at the end, after this slide, there's a couple of slides where I've listed uh, resources for you. Um, and this will be up on the as part of the, the PowerPoint. So... Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gwen. Uh, that was a great webinar. And uh, I know we took a little couple minutes of extra time there, but I think the exercises there that we went through were very useful. So we really appreciate your time. Um, and you really taught us about how to recognize diabetes distress, um, you know, as well as how to manage it um, when living with diabetes. So once again, thank you so much. Um, folks, we do have a couple minutes left for questions, so I'll do my best to get them answered. Um, but if there are any remaining questions I do not get to, please email us at webinars at diabetes.ca and I'll be happy to follow up with you. So um, with that being said, our first question here, Gwen, is I find that when I try to be mindful, I start thinking about my thinking. How do I overcome that? I'm laughing. <laughs> Because, of course, this is really, really common. So what we, one thing we might say is, do you notice that you're actually thinking about your thinking, All right? And um, the, the, in the practice, uh, we have the same um, instruction, which is to just gently label this as thinking, and then as best you can return to whatever the other focus is. So mindfulness in its basic is uh, but is uh, training your attention to move to where you're directing it. And uh, so it's not wrong that you're thinking or that the mind moves away from the focus. Uh, we say that, you know, even to congratulate yourself on that, the muscle of mindfulness is noticing where the mind went, noticing where your attention went, and then the returning of it. Great. Thanks for that, Gwen. Um, our next participant has said, is there a relationship between guilt and distress? For example, somebody who is living with type 2 feeling like it's their fault. Yes, um, absolutely. The feeling of guilt is something that really increases distress. And of course, guilt comes from also how um, diabetes is viewed in society. And I think there is a lot of blaming on people who are living with diabetes. And guilt itself is emotion that we want to bring awareness to and we want to release because guilt is really paralyzing. 
and uh, um, and isn't a useful emotion for moving us forward towards change. So this is something that we want to bring up. We want to allow it to vent, and and, and we want to notice it and support it, but we actually want to move beyond it and perhaps probably challenge it with um, the cognitive behavioral technique of the thought records. Um that would be one really good way to deal with uh, guilt and also making small goals uh, to move you towards your uh, diabetes uh, self-management and self-care. It's important for you. Okay, and we'll just take our last question here. And again, apologies if we didn't get to your questions, but please feel free to email us at webinars at diabetes.ca and we'll be happy to follow up. Um, Gwen, our next question here from our participant is asking if there's a relationship between exercise and distress. Absolutely, there uh, there really is. We know from um, under, our understanding of stress, um, which is you know, this fight and flight reaction, and it's an automatic reaction, and it mobilizes the body system. And originally it was designed, we often say, to fight the saber-toothed tiger or run from the saber-toothed tiger. It's part of our primitive brain. So exercise was something that would have resolved stress. And, of course, now we don't resolve stress through fight and flight. We actually just bottle it up inside in different ways. And uh, so exercise that expends that energy is a way to reduce stress and would be another strategy to employ with um, uh, to help with reducing diabetes distress also. Great. Thank you so much for that, Gwen. And folks, that does conclude our webinar for today. I'd sincerely like to thank Gwen for speaking on behalf of the Canadian Diabetes Association. It's been a really, really great learning experience, so we definitely appreciate it. I do want to remind everyone that our webinar today has been recorded and will be made available on both our CDA YouTube channel as well as on our diabetes.ca website. And I do want to say once again a quick thank you to our supporter, Canola Eatwell, for supporting our webinars program. We do have two more webinars that are coming up, uh, ending off our 2016 year. So be sure to register and participate in them. Our first one next week is on staying on track during the holiday season. And following that, on December the 15th, we'll be discussing the glycemic index. And for those of you um, who have family and friends that have not yet taken the test to know their risk for diabetes, we urge and encourage you to encourage them to take the test. Um, it's the CAN risk test, and it can be found on our CDA website. Um, if you want to go to www.diabetestest.ca, um, you'll have more information there as well as the test. So we encourage you to do that and to send it out to your networks as well. And for those of you just looking for some more general support, information, and resources to live well with diabetes, please feel free to call our 1-800 number. So it's 1-800-BANTING. It's 1-800-226-8464. We thank you for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed learning with the CDA, and we look forward to your participation in the future. <laughs>